afternoon everyone and welcome back to Chief Disrupt Live Virtual April 2021. My name is Shama Banerjee and I am the Senior Editor at Nimbus 90. I'm delighted to introduce our first panel of the afternoon, Inclusive Thinking, Rebalancing Organisational Diversity. Um, on this panel, um, we have Brandy Deenan, who is the Chief Executive Officer at Peer Health, Steve Prest, who is the Deputy Director of Acquisition at the Royal Navy and an advocate for gender in defence, Anne Roberts, who is the Chief People Officer at Flow Health, and Abigail Wilmore, who is the Chief People Officer at Stella McCartney. Thank you all so much for joining. It's great to have you with us. So to kick off, um, let's, if we could just do some quick introductions around the room. Um, Anne, if I could come to you first for an introduction. Oh, absolutely. Hello, everybody. Uh, as Shama said, I'm the uh, Chief People Officer at Flow Health, um, the world's largest health and wellness app by MAU and Downloads. We're helping 41 million women take control of their physical and mental well-being. Prior to Flow, I was the Group H Director of Bumble. Um, from the dating app worlds um, leading up to its uh, recent IPO this February. Um, and I've been in tech for a long time, spearheading missions and, and building companies for a better world. Thanks, Anne. Brandy, if I come to you next. Tara, good afternoon, everybody. It's lovely to uh, be meet you all. My name is Brandy Dean and I'm Chief Exec Officer um, at Peer Health Group within the NHS in primary care. Um, I am about 70 days old in my role, uh, prior to which I was Managing Director at Michael P. White Restaurants um, and have worked in retail, hospitality, aviation, um, and of course now healthcare. I'm here today because I'm passionate about diversity and I can't wait to uh, catch up with you all. Thank you. Thanks, Brandy. Can't wait to dive into the conversation. Steve, over to you. Uh, thank you. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Commodore Steve Prest, and uh, as Shama said, I'm the uh, Deputy Director of Navy Acquisition uh, for Equipment and Systems in the Royal Navy and the Senior Responsible Owner of uh, three of our major equipment programmes. Uh, I've been in the Navy for 22 years, and my, my career at sea has taken me uh, all across the road, uh, all across the world, uh, chasing pirates and staffing drug smugglers and and all sorts of all sorts of things ashore. I've mostly focused in capability and acquisition. Thank you, Steve and Abigail. Finally, over to you. Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Abigail. I'm the Chief People Officer at Stella McCartney. I've actually been here for 15 years, um, so a really long time, and we are. A really values-led organization so it was set up as a vegetarian company so no animals coming to any harm in the making of the products um, but now it's about so much more than that 20 years on um, encompassing all of sustainability and kind of changing the way that the fashion industry and wider industry works um, and I'm also super passionate about inclusion and you know making sure that we have an inclusive culture at Stella because of our strong values it's kind of even more of a responsibility that we feel so that's why I'm here. Uh, thanks everyone and great to have you all joining us. So to dive straight into the conversation, um, we will have a poll coming up shortly on our screens. I think that will be coming up in a second while we are getting that poll up and running. Um, I'd love to hear a bit about um, people's thoughts on what does diversity actually mean? There's been a lot happen in the last year or so in terms of Black Lives Matter and then more recently with the um, Sarah Everard case. Um, there is a lot happening in this area and how we are thinking about it is evolving as well. So Brandy, if I could come to you first, what does diversity mean and how should we think about it now? Thank you, Shama. Interesting question. Um, so I have a slightly unique uh, take on diversity in terms of, of its meaning. And um, when I think diversity, I, I think holistically, actually, about all the visible and invisible facets of diversity, which makes us all unique and how we actually can harness this opportunity. Um, so diversity uh, for me is factoring in gender, factoring in race, ethnicity, neurodiversity in terms of how our brains are wired, disability, socioeconomic status, parenthood, and of course, caring responsibilities as well, health, mental health and well-being, um, religion, belief, age and generation, nationality, culture, intersectionality, belonging, inclusion, factoring all of these in our everyday decision making and everyday life. Um, for me, in terms of um, how we should think about diversity in the light of the recent events that we all uh, know about, here's my thoughts. Um, whether you're actually leading the way um, or just trying to keep up with diversity, because I think we're all at different stages, um, whether you're actually chasing every research or every report that's been published uh, about diversity, 
or just simply counting them down. It really doesn't matter where you are. We can all now say with a lot of confidence um, that we actually know a little bit more about one or two aspects of diversity than we did a year or two ago. Um, and so I think it's about um, the question remains, what do we want to do about it? Do we even want to do anything about it? And that's my thinking when it comes to how we think about diversity in the recent events. Thanks, Brandy. And Steve, can I come to you next from how that looks in your experience in um, the Navy? Yeah, and I think it builds on, on Brandy's point, actually, uh, in the sense that diversity for me is about really acknowledging and understanding that people experience the world differently from how you experience it. Um, the Royal Navy is, is still a relatively homogenous organisation. You know, it is predominantly uh, white, uh, heterosexual men, not, not exclusively by any stretch, but, but you know, predominantly. Um, and I think we fall into the trap sometimes of assuming, therefore, that everybody in the Navy experiences it in the way that we do. Uh, and it was talking to a couple of uh, female colleagues a few years ago in, uh, when I was serving in HMS Queen Elizabeth, uh, you, the ship you may have seen on the news this morning, um, that, that it struck me that that's, that's just not true. Uh, they experienced the Navy quite differently from me in, an, in a number of, of aspects. And that was really, for me, as I thought about it, a moment where I thought, well, I, I, I owe it to the people in our organisation to, to do and be a bit better about this stuff. Um, and there's two reasons for that for me. Firstly, there's a basic point of fairness. You know, if you if you subscribe to the view that your organisation is a meritocracy, um, that can only be true um, if you've got a level playing field and if everybody can compete on an equitable basis. Um, and where you have those differences of the way people are experiencing interact with the organisation, that, that's really hard to get right. So fairness is really important. And the second point for me is as a leader, if you don't understand how the people in your team and in your organization experience uh, things different from you, then, then you can't lead them properly. And if you're not leading them properly and you're not embracing that diversity and you're not creating an environment where everybody can maximize their potential, then as a leader, your team is not performing as well as it could do. Um, it's not delivering as best as it can. And therefore, I think as leaders, we have a duty to embrace diversity, to understand the people that work for us and with us, and, and to, and to maximise uh, their opportunities to, to fulfil their potential. Definitely. And I think it would be great to get the, the results of the poll up, just so we can see how people are faring with where they are with this journey that you're, that you're talking about there, Steve, while we're getting those up. Abigail, I wonder if you have kind of thoughts in this area, just in terms of what Steve and Brandy have shared so far. So one of the, um, one of the pieces of research um, that McKinsey has done recently talks about how women tend to fall behind men at that very first step up from entry level to manager. Why is that just while we're getting those results up? Well, I have to say that working at Stella, we have, I feel like I live in a bit of a bubble when it comes to to women in leadership. And I know that this is not the norm, but I think it, it tells a story anyway. And that is that, you know, at Stella, we are about 70% women anyway. We've got 700 people globally, um, which is quite common for a fashion brand and quite common in retail as well, that you would have a high percentage of female representation in the company. But that isn't always the case. It doesn't always translate into leadership positions. And as that study was um, saying exactly, but at Stella, it always has. And um, so we actually have 60% of women at leadership level. Um, and I think there's two main factors around why that's the case. Obviously, when you, when your owner, founder um, is female and believes um, in, in, you know, women in leadership, that's obviously one of the most important factors. And therefore, we have role models at every level of the organization. So, you know, younger women can see themselves um, at leadership level. And that's why representation is so important. And having a diverse leadership team is so important, because then you're able, um, as a, you know, a younger person coming into um, an organization, you're able to see that it is possible um, to get there. So that's what, you know, in terms of um, female um, representation, that's what it's like at Stella. And I, I feel very um, conscious that we need to talk about that more externally as something that is, you know, really 
key um, and that we're kind of pioneering in that way. Definitely. And Anne, what has your experience been? Because obviously you've worked in many different industries, organisations, so slightly different to Abigail and, and Stella McCartney. Um, what's your experience been of this? Yeah, um, I was thinking over it's a it's a fascinating question, fascinating research that um, lies behind it. I, I think so much of your career is is de- it's is really determined by by how it takes off by the first you know two to four years of, of early career. Um, and it can either make you, you know, if you if you join a prestigious grad scheme or you join a Google early career development or a business with a great brand name, um, or if you don't. Um, and these really are the formative years of, of learning about how you think, what does challenge mean, how is work rewarded and punished, what is expected of you. It really forms your self-perception. So in those early years, if you have a manager or a coach or a mentor or anybody, um, whether formal or informal, who who tells you to show up every day with the confidence of a, of a mediocre white man, um, as the saying goes, you will remember that. And this is where the paths to career acceleration diverge, I think, um, between people with um, agency and empowerment um, and, and a sense of self-efficacy and the people without, um, even regardless of what box you tick on the diversity buckets, so to say, whether it's men or women or people from different ethnic backgrounds. And the problem is then amplified through that broken rung in the industry, especially when we talk about tech, um, that growing managers is very hard, notoriously hard. And companies increasingly prefer to buy rather than make strong managers. And buying them is heavily impacted by the halo effect, by the signals you get from the industry. So you look for uh, a tried and tested, somebody else with a good name has, has hired them, so they must be, so they must be good for it. And that amplifies the acceleration. Um, and, and again, that divergence is is further pronounced. And, and the problem is coming from companies being very risk averse to, to take a chance on somebody, whether that's internal or external, um, and really mindfully and consciously take a chance on somebody um, and grow that talent internally rather than going for the tried and trusted proven because that only that only extenuates the, the existing gap, so to say, from the first broken rung to then onwards. Definitely. Thank you for kind of illustrating that, Anne. Um, so then if we think about this issue of representation, when it comes to getting underrepresented groups into leadership positions, Brandy and Steve, I'd like to kind of come to you with your experience in the organisations that you've been in. Do you think there's been a problem with virtue signalling in organisations in this area? What's your experience been, Brandy, if you want to go first? Do I think there's been a problem with virtual signalling Um When it comes to underrepresentation groups in leadership, yes, 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 and yes. And and here's why. Um, I think until we actually get to a space where diversity is actually woven into the fabric of all organisations and what they're about, until organisations are connected with all communities. I mean, I I laid out the facets um, of of diversity there. There's loads of communities that sit in there. And we all believe that we're strengthened genuinely by our differences. I think until we we believe that together, together we can change the world. Um, and until we start celebrating this fact, then oh hell yes, you know we there is a lot of virtue signaling going on. Um, because he, here's the thing: we cannot declare mission accomplished as soon as one milestone is reached. There's a lot of stuff on diversity. If we're ticking one box, we can't um, actually say we've reached there. Um, or when a fragile, opaque result has been actually detected. No, no, no way. Organizations have got to get their diversity act together, you know, once and for all. Um, and, and I appreciate this is a really ouch moment for lots of our organizations. But ouch is good. We need ouch moments to allow us to actually rethink and rebalance organisational diversity. And I'd like to just kind of draw on what you're saying there about where are you with your journey? And let's if we can get those poll results up now, that would that would be fab just so we can see the spread. OK, so we've got 59 percent, which is the majority sat in. We are implementing DNI strategies. So what is everyone's response there? Is that better or worse than than we were expecting? Yeah, 59, sort of, we, we sat on the fence, um, some haven't got any in place. What will be interesting is out of the 59 DNI strategies, what are the facets that we're looking at? Are we looking at visible diversity or in, invisible diversity? But, but it's good to see that everybody's doing something, even if they're at the end or starting. Mm-hmm. 
All right. So going back to what you were saying then, Brandy, um, with that sense of, you know, our organization's virtue signaling, how then, I guess, if we take that to the next level, if we were, to, you know, coming back to what Abigail was saying, it's important to have that representation and leadership so that we can start building kind of younger generations. But how um, can organizations ensure that they aren't filling quotas for the sake of filling quotas, but actually kind of weaving that diversity through the fabric of their organization? And Steve, I wonder if you have thoughts on that. Yeah, I'll just pick up on the, the virtue signaling point first, if I may, which is, I mean, it's, it's a slightly toxic phrase, a bit like being woke or politically correct. It, it's, it, it tends to be used as a term of abuse. But I think my premise, I think Brandy sort of touched on this in her analysis of the poll is, at least people are, are talking about these issues, at least it's on the table. I, and I'd rather that than nobody talking about it, even if sometimes the actions uh, aren't matched you know, don't match the words. But in terms of pulling people through the organisation uh, into senior roles, and I think Abigail was absolutely spot on in, in terms of how much uh, representation matters, how much role models matter. The, the Navy is a really interesting organisation to look at because we're a bottom fed system. Um, so, you know, no one joins as a, an admiral, no one joins as a commodore. You, you, you know, you come in new entry training and have to work your way up through the pipeline. So we can't buy in diversity at levels we have to we have to grow it and we've been really bad at it actually I, I, I'm a Commodore um, I, there has never been a woman in the Navy uh, who's been a more senior rank than the rank I hold today so we've never had a woman admiral in fact well excluding excluding Princess Anne but then, then she didn't really come through the system in the way that everyone else does and having had women at sea and, and being full you know participants in the Royal Navy um, for, for the last 30 years we're not doing something right. Uh, and when you look at, at, at the senior women in the Navy um, and you compare them to the senior men, and we, we've done some sort of psychometric and aptitude testing and so on, the women on average, albeit a small sample size, have a higher average score than the average man. Well, that, that's a measurement of the gradient they've got to get up when the men are running on the, on the flat. You know, again, privilege is a, a slightly toxic term, but, you know, if I'm running my race on the flat, and my female colleagues are having to run up a five or 10% gradient, then we have to think as an organization about how you correct for that, because you've got to do so in order to make it fair. And having run this for, you know, 30 years, it's quite apparent it's not going to happen unless we take some sort of positive action. Now, I'm not, I'm not suggesting qu quotas are necessarily the right answer. But what I am saying is we have to make some uh, different choices if we want a different outcome uh, and I think we need a different outcome for, for the reasons that the other speakers have have articulated that the diversity is important and and you know so we need more women we need more people of color in our senior leadership uh, and so what we have to do is take positive action to address some of the structural barriers that they face one of which by the way is not having people in senior positions who look like them so we're going to have to put some people in senior positions now we're not just going to go fishing for anybody who, you know, who ticks the boxes of all, all the sort of, you know, diverse criteria. What we're going to do is find some really good people and make sure that, you know, they, they go in at the right level. And we, we grow and mentor them and coach them through the system such that they can achieve not, you know, so they get there on their merits, but have been supported through the system in the way, frankly, that men already are. Um, and so it's more for me about leveling the playing field in, in those sorts of ways. Um, and, and of course, the standard charge this as well. Well, if, if you're favouring people of certain characteristics, how do you know they're the best person for the job? Well, let me tell you, the system already favours people of a certain characteristic and they tend to be white men. How do we know they're the best people for the job? I, I, I don't know. Because, you know, guess what? Some of the women that, that joined around the same time as me will already have left or will have had, you know, to run into headwinds or uphills that I, I frankly haven't had to run up. And they may well have been better, better than me. But, but they just, you know, didn't stay the course because, well, why would you? So, so I think we have to reframe the conversation about, you know, some of this positive action. That actually it's not, it's not favouring, it's not favouritism. All you're doing is correcting an injustice. Mm. I'd like to just draw on, there's, there's a point now, I think, building off what you've been saying, Steve. Um, it's been put in the chat by Donna Roberts. So Donna, thank you for adding this in. Um, she's riffing off the poll results that we saw earlier. She says 59% is a nice number, but risk is that many programs are mostly hiring or recruiting targets, but not so much work for retention and the equity aspect. 
why are companies who claim to be working on diversity so shy about sharing and publishing some actual metrics data and answering surveys on the topic to be compared to or set the bar for their peers? Abigail, if I could come to you for that, um, for your thoughts on that. I think it's because it's quite shameful. People, you know, companies feel ashamed about what those statistics really show. Ultimately, that's what it what it's about. And we yet we need to feel in a place where we can do that so that we can have, you know, the uncomfortable conversations that we need to have about it. You know, I think one of the conversations that's not happening right now that needs to happen more is around accountability and how do we actually, like we can have the best talent acquisition strategy in, in the world, we can have the best DNI, you know, strategy and policy, but unless, you know, as, as Steve was saying, unless people want to stay, unless we're able to retain people in a, in a you know inclusive culture then we're going to fall down and we're not going to be able to have diverse teams that that we so want and that we so need so we have to focus on on different areas and i think you know there is a lot of different factors that that can um ensure that people not only feel a sense of individual responsibility but that we're able to hold people accountable to that ourselves you know and organizations i think it comes down to the right tech tools in order to listen to your people and that people can input into you know and help to design the culture but also design the strategy around equity around diversity you know to help design it together um, I think it's about having the right behaviors identified really clearly of what inclusive leadership actually looks like so that people can again be held accountable to those behaviors and it's about creating a culture where it's safe to speak up not only anonymously but safe to share your lived experience safe to you know fail in some ways um and that is a, a again a combination of things that needs to come together but it's it's the culture and accountability that we need to really focus on in order to really be able to drive this forward i think um and then you know if those behaviors have been identified then rewarding and you know recognizing those behaviors on a continual consistent basis in a really clear way is going to help to create that culture more long term and basically an environment in which people do want to stay from different diverse backgrounds. Definitely I think that's going to link link to um, the conversation we're going to have in a few minutes about belonging but before we move on to that and I'd just like to come to you on your thoughts where are the in terms of what what we've kind of discussed already we've we've covered lots of different things but um actually where we are in different industries where where are we seeing gaps in the discussions around diversity what are we actually missing as um business leaders um in the um tech industry interestingly what i've been grappling with for the last four to five years is that the largest difficulty with diversity is creating it across national cultures and borders um, rather than by the buckets of the diversity that we consider now, which is gender, ethnicity, religion, etc. We now have global workforces, increasingly global now, more than they will ever be um, off the back of the COVID year. And there is far more in common in the mental modes and expectations of people who are coming from one country and one culture between men and women, between whatever the skin color is how they think about life and work um, than between, let's say, women across different countries as a whole. So, um, you know, the way Steve said before, Royal Navy is still a homogenous organization. I'll challenge him to look at, a, at an average European tech business because I think it, it might punch even higher in, um, in that homogeneity in terms of, uh, in terms of ways of thinking. Um, and we have an imperative to reflect on the diversity of our user base, whatever business you run. Um, and we can hire mirroring that diversity, um, but it doesn't end there. It starts there, um, exactly like was pointed out in the in, in the chat. It's all about uh, getting people in, but then what happens? Um, and you know that that kind of first ninety day, first six month uh, failure rate in in new appointments is is phenomenally high. It's unfortunate and it's very expensive for the businesses. Um, so how do you get to shared alignment on how we do user research, how we build products that our customers love? How do those products reflect the diversity in the world? How do we ideate and innovate and build mm -hmm. across those different national cultures is, is a really difficult organizational process to figure out. 
um, really, really difficult. And I also feel like we, we, nobody talks about, it, it's something that has become normatively an agenda around diversity. Um, and we don't talk about the downside of diversity that comes from the research so that it could be managed well. Um, from you know, research on social cohesion, on decision-making, how it makes in small groups, it can make us slower, how it can make decision-making more difficult, how it can create more conflict. There's a need for companies to acknowledge that and be aware of that and say, we are mindful of that and we're doing it for the right end goal and we would take the short-term um, challenges rather than ending up churning through employees that they got in with great intent and they end up churning out because off the back of some, you know, they didn't fit into how we do things culture because that's not sufficient anymore. Mm -hmm. And there's a, there's a point which has come through the chat um, on that and which I guess, how do you actually do that? There's a question around, like you just said, diversity and inclusion seems to be a very reactive topic for um, boards. How do you bring all leaders across the board to promote and sponsor within your organization? And Brandy, I wonder if you've got any kind of points to add on Anne's, Anne's answer there. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I agree with what both um, Anne and Steve and, and of course Abigail have said. Um, I think for me, here's the thing, people actually monitor their own biases um, when they expect that other people will actually see what decisions they've made yeah so i would put energy from an organizational perspective in to um, abigail's point in holding people accountable and commitment on this agenda uh, for the long haul than i would anything else um and you can't see what you can't be so yes highlight visible diversity um and if you want to drop a quota in there to, to, to steve's point it helps fix a quick thing as in fix the pipeline problem but it doesn't solve your all the solutions but what about invisible di di um, diversity how, how are we highlighting it so i guess for me it's about um making sure that everybody in the organization can can see somebody at the top that looks like them and also making sure that we've got accountability and we, we're in for the long haul rather than a short haul simply hitting quotas and presenting some stats just to back to virtual signal definitely yes go for it steve so I, I think there's some interesting comments in 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 the chat um and, and about this embedding diversity and inclusion and, and james is point about it not being a bolt on I, I think I think speaks to forgive me who raised the original point Snenar you know who said how, how do you get this embedded and I think that the point is to, to say to people look you know if you're being an inclusive leader that's not something different from being a good leader you know you can't be a good leader and then go oh yeah and I need to do some diversity and inclusion stuff as well uh pencil it in for a week next Tuesday that, that, that's not how this works in, in an organization that I come from People can get away with it a bit because it, it's quite it's quite heter uh, sorry homogeneous and therefore you know actually the sort of relatively small numbers of people um, you know who don't fit the mold um, can can get some but that's not good leadership you know that creates a toxic a toxicity it, it creates a, a team which is not cohesive um, and and it, it ultimately becomes self defeating so. A lot of people, when you when you and I advocate quite a lot on social media, I'm um, on there as at fighting sailors. Should anyone be interested? But when you people go, oh well, I don't think we should. You know, if you're going to go to war, I don't think you should worry about whether you're offending people. It's not about offending people. I'm quite happy to offend people. Um, you know, I'm a sailor. I use bad language a lot. You know, that's not what it's about. What it is is about having a team. And let's use let's use the, the war analogy, which is in the best shape it can be, which is bought into it into the mission. It's cohesive. Is going to look out for each other and he's going to win the fight when when i really really need them to um that's, that's not about that's not about political correctness that's not about avoiding offense that's not woke. that's just bloody good leadership and, and if you dig anything else you know and i don't think we have conversations about diversity and inclusion in those terms I, I, and one of the things i'm you know i like about this session is you know it, it it's addressing diversity and inclusion as an integral part of of disruption in the, in the tech in the tech business which is absolutely where it should be. Definitely. And I'd like to just move the conversation on a bit towards belonging and where, where that sits in the whole conversation, because we've, we've kind of covered diversity and inclusion. I'd like to hone in a bit deeper on belonging and just see, um, see everyone's thoughts on that. So it's obviously an important part of the conversation. Um, Abigail, if I can come to you, how do you foster cultures of belonging within an organisation? I think it comes down to 
connection and you know again leaders role modeling and not even just role modeling leaders being empathetic really actively listening not just you know on on the normal kind of listening levels but reading the signs and giving people space to listen and and you know building compassion ultimately people want to be led by someone who is real and you don't always have to have all the answers you know you're definitely not going to know all the answers certainly that's been proven in the last last 15 months with the pandemic um but just you know making it safe again that's ultimately what's going to give people a sense of belonging as well as obviously having your you know your your purpose and mission and and all of that side of things as an organization but what we can do as leaders or as individuals is is you know create a safe again a safe space for people to be themselves i know that's rather overused at the moment um to bring your whole self to work but it is really also also true you know we've had so many centuries of um working with so many masks and to remove those masks is is um you have to be vulnerable in order to do that. Um, and I think making it safe to be vulnerable is one of the key things to creating a wider sense of belonging and, and connection with others. Definitely. And Brandy, I'd like to come to you because I know that you've got a lot of thoughts in, on belonging in particular. Um, what would your response be to Abigail just in terms of building on, building on those points she's raised there? I think Abigail's actually dressed it as how I would dress it. I, I, would, I wouldn't segregate belonging out of the diversity agenda. Belonging is a part of the diversity agenda. So in creating the diversity, I would make sure that, you know, I have diversity and inclusion and belonging sits under, that, that is the bedrock. If, if nobody belongs and nobody feels like they're part of something special, you cannot build blocks, you know. Um, belonging is a bit like... Um, our rooftop or, 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 or our base and so I, I would bulk all of it and I would make sure that in all organizations people feel heard and I think Abigail mentioned that people have got to feel heard people have got to feel that um, it's okay to speak out it's okay to say how they feel and it's a cultural thing and you know we know culture is part of diversity and to back to Steve's point um and and, and also um to Anne's point this is all this is all one big thing you know there is no different facets of it it all sits under the one umbrella so it's good to see that we've got 59 percent of organizations that have got a dni agenda that are delivering in terms of who, who's on here today Let's just make sure we revisit it and make sure that the DNI agenda doesn't just sit under the two headings. There is a lot more to DNI than we normally talk about. Let's just bring it all together. One of the things that I've started to get really passionate about um, is, is neurodiversity, you know, which, which for me is just fascinating because we, we've all heard somebody say, oh, that person's a little bit, you know, it takes them a while to understand stuff. Well, you know, to Anne's point, let's make sure decision making in organisations is much slower to incorporate that person's views. So, uh, you know, because that's the only way that person will belong. So I would I would bring it all under that one umbrella. Thanks, Brandy. Well, we've got three minutes left um, before this particular session ends. So I'd love to just whiz around the group and just get each person's number one action from the audience today to start driving positive change in this area. And if I can come to you first. Um, yeah, I would say to be genuinely inclusive, you have to make um, inclusivity visible over and over. You know, we cringe at the idea that it feels forced, as some sort of HR agenda, you know, it's all the virtue signaling. Um, but I would push back on say, and say the, the, the signaling part of the virtue signaling is important because the signaling um, is what gets attention. It, it signals what gets recognized and shows what is rewarded and what is punished. Um, and in, in, in that sense, um, leading, you know, company-wide, whether that's, you know, uh, through Slack channels or whatever you're using nowadays, um, serendipitously every day recognizing and pulling people in and opening a conversation in a very, very casual way that makes everybody feel welcome, whatever background they're from, can seem trite and, and kind of banal, but those little signals and those little moves do have an impact and then they do send a message. Thank you, Anne. Abigail? Well, my number one thing would be if organizations are still doing an annual survey, um, engagement survey of their people or biannual to just move away from that immediately and get rid of it and just move towards continual conversations in a similar kind of 
tool, but one where you can ask really specific questions, you know, a smaller amount of questions. We're doing it at the moment at Stella McCartney every two weeks or between two and three weeks where we ask three questions to everybody. And they're always different questions up to six months. Um, and then you get the same kind of questions so we can measure it. But you can ask questions about how included people feel, you know, do they feel a sense of belonging? And you can ultimately therefore create, you know, the culture of inclusion with, with people um, because you're really able to listen. Thanks, Abigail. Steve, I'll come to you next and then Brandy. I think I think for me, it takes me back to where I started, really, which is don't assume and encourage everyone else in your organisation not to assume that other people experience the organisation and the team that you're all part of in, ex in the same way you do. Have the humility to listen, to really listen, and then apply that knowledge that you've gained to just be a better leader for your people. And that in and of itself will will drive a, a change of culture. Thank you, Steve. And Brandy, I'll close with you. Okay, so for me, it's about connecting dots and leaving a legacy in our story. So wise people, wise leaders, wise organisations connect to dots. That is, what I do today is going to impact tomorrow. Um, and, uh, you know, wise people understand, wise organisations understand that this is connected, okay? In the same way, wise people, wise organisations also want to leave legacies um, for, for after those dots have been connected. Um, so, in other words, what story do I want to tell? The reason this is so important right now and this conversation is cool and on point right now is this one day diversity is simply going to be a story that we all have to tell all right it won't be anything new because everyone will be doing it and everyone wants to be a hero in their own story nobody wants to be the one that was irresponsible in their story you know what part you want to play in that story is, is entirely up to you and your organization so to the audience today i say let's let's all stay wise Let's connect the dots to the diversity impact and let's go leave a le legacy in our own diversity stories because we don't want to be the ones to be seen as the ones that were irresponsible. One day diversity will not be a topic. Not sure when, but one day it went. Thank you, Brandy. And thank you, everyone, Abigail, Steve, Brandy and Anne, um, so much for this conversation. Um, but I think it's been a really fab discussion. I hope you've all enjoyed it as much as I have. But thank you, everyone.